This morning, in our text in Joel chapter number 2, we finally get to the text that everyone quotes. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's the day we're waiting for. The spirit writing through Joel says that he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. This book so far has talked to us about looking at the current times that we live in. As God has lifted his hand off our nation because of our nation's rejection of the word of God. And therefore the locusts have been sent and they have come in to devour our land. This book has also called us to a solemn, sacred assembly of weeping and mourning and fasting and praying. And both nights, both Tuesday and Thursday nights, there were those who came to the the sanctuary and I could hear the weeping before the Lord. And as wonderful as that sounded to me, I just wondered how wonderful this must have sounded to God to hear weeping and mourning in his temple when he has said and declared that his house should be a house of prayer. This book is now telling us what we can expect God to do as we render or open our hearts and turn to God with our whole heart. So let's step into this exciting promise that God has given us. And I'm going to ask you to stand if you can as we read from Joel chapter number 2. And I'm beginning at verse number 28 this morning. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also my my manservants and my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and the awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Hmm, that's wonderful. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Let's pray together. Father, I ask this morning that you would anoint my lips and my heart, that, Father, I may speak the truth of your word. Father, we know this is a very well-known portion of Scripture. Lord, we've heard many sermons in regards to what you're going to do in the last days. But Father, I pray this morning that that revelation of what you're going to speak to us about will come through clearly through the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, I ask for the anointing to receive the word this morning in each of our hearts. And that Lord, truly we would find that place today, Father, to surrender our lives fully to you that you may do what you need to do in our lives. So I thank you right now, Father, for ministering through your word to us. In Jesus' name, I now pray, amen and amen. And you may be seated, and thank you again for honoring God by standing for the reading of the word. It shall come to pass afterwards. After what? After the solemn sacred assembly, after the fasting, the weeping, praying, and repentance, after turning to God with our whole hearts, after rendering or opening our hearts to God, afterwards, I, meaning God, will pour out my spirit upon all flesh or people. The last part of this chapter speaks of the spiritual blessings God is promising to his people who have joined the solemn sacred assembly, who have repented with fasting and weeping and prayer and have turned to God with their whole heart. And he gives us the results. How will we know that this is going to happen? 
Your old men will dream dreams. You're looking at an old guy who still dreams. You're not that excited about that, okay? <laughs> Young men will see visions. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. In essence, a vast hope of people will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and God will show us signs and wonders. And I believe that we will not, only, we, we will not be caught unaware of the great and awesome day of the coming of the Lord. Not only that, but in verse 32, which is a very significant uh, scripture, Joel points out that there will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and when that happens, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. We need an ingathering. We need an ingathering of souls that are lost. Hell is real, just as real as heaven is. And it is time for us to wake up to that fact that everybody without Christ is headed to hell at this moment. But God said that if you will come to a sacred assembly, if you will weep and fast and pray, if you will call upon the name of the Lord, I will send the Holy Spirit... And the Holy Spirit will allow it so that everyone who names the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel makes a, a declaring statement of absolute hope. As God's people gather for a solemn sacred assembly, as God's people will fast, weep, and pray, as God's people will turn with their whole heart, as God's people will open and render their hearts to God, God will pour out His Spirit upon all, upon all our children. Somebody's got to get excited about that idea. I'm serious. It's time for our young people not just to know about Christ. They need to experience Christ. Can we say amen to that? It's time for our, our young adults in our church to have a brand new, fresh experience with God. Not just hear and know about Him, but to experience Him. I will pour out my, my Spirit upon teenagers. Wow. I want them to experience something so that it doesn't wear off in two weeks. God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all women, upon all men. I'm even going to pour it out upon your servants. I'm going to pour it upon all of mankind. As God pours out his spirit, we will speak in prophecies and dreams and visions as we live with the anointing of the Holy Spirit in it, not just around us. Lost men and women will hear our anointed message, turn to Christ, call upon his name in conviction and repentance, and they shall be saved. What a marvelous message of hope that Joel has given us here. We've had all these instructions. We've, we've been told to do this. We've been told to do that. Get to doing this. If you'll do this, if you'll do that, if you'll do that, now I will pour out my spirit upon you. What a marvelous message of hope that Joel has brought to us this morning, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Can you imagine this public school next door to us here, filled with children, with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and they start class in the morning, and some child raises their hand and says, what, teacher, we're not going to pray before we get started? You don't think that wouldn't be great? And whether the teacher did or not, guess what? All the children started to pray. Well, that can't happen because we have separation of church and state. You might in the natural have separation of church and state, but you cannot keep God out of the public schools. I'm going to tell you why. You know how we don't pray in school? That's a lot of baloney. Every child in school prays. You know why? Because they give tests. Every child prays in school. What a message Joel is giving us here. After 
the solemn assembly. After the people have gathered and the congregation is set apart. See, when you came to the revival prayer meeting this past week, you were setting yourselves apart. You were sanctifying yourselves unto God. Now, there were five things that I said we needed to pray about. What you came to pray about is up to you. But this is what we, we talked about. One is that the fear of the Lord would return to our nation. Number two, that the integrity and purity would return to the church. Number three, that the church would return to evangelism. Number four, that godly leadership would return to our nation and our churches. And number five, that we would we have a national spiritual awakening. Then, as we prayed for that, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. When? After? Believers have turned to God with their whole heart. After the church has turned to God in seeking his presence and his face. See, we have sought God for this. We've sought God for that. We've told God what we need. We've told God this is what we've got to have. And yet we just sang a song here this morning that says, Lord, I, I surrender to whatever you want to do. That's a total different type of prayer. That's a total different type of, of, of relationship when you say, God, I, I want you to do what you want to do in me. Because what will happen is I'll begin to see the face of God. Enjoying his presence, spending time with him, developing a spiritual connection, and then we will experience abiding under his shadow. After his people who are called by his name have turned to God in dedication and commitment. Oh, how God desires for us to return to him in intimacy, in a, in a dedication and a commitment of worship. Oh, how God desires of his people to make a commitment and a vow to live in the covenant relationship with Christ and abide in the loving relationship of dedication. After the church, the people, a person values the presence of God, literally being or living as afraid of losing the presence. Have you ever lived in that place? Lord, what if you would leave me? What if your presence wasn't there? Would it scare anybody? Or have we lived so long without it that we don't recognize he's not there? Samson got to that place that he did not know when the Spirit left him. Let's not get to that place, church. Let's get to the place in our lives where we live so so righteous and holy and pure as we possibly can so that we do not lose his presence in our lives. Because he says, then I will pour out my spirit, saith the Lord, upon all flesh. After we have opened our hearts, that which opens our hearts to God is fasting and weeping and mourning, in essence, praying. Those three actions open our heart for Christ to come in. It is, it is as fast, weep, and pray that Christ can remove everything and every hindrance in our lives. Because when he removes all of the hindrances, when he removes everything in our lives that should not be there, then God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I believe the New Testament would challenge us not to settle for the Holy Spirit just being or falling upon us. Rather, that we are to turn to God with our whole heart in fasting and weeping and praying so that the Holy Spirit can come and live in us. We need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. Amen, Pastor. Here's one of the significant reasons why. With the Holy Spirit in us, the battles that we face will be from the outside of us instead of the inside of us. Meaning with the Holy Spirit indwelling and infilling us, the attacks of Satan cannot come from within us. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is living in us. And so the battle is only out there. And when the battle is only out there, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. Hmm. 
See, when God pours out his spirit upon the church, there will be a glorious reversal. Instead of the church lacking influence, it will be filled with influence. The presence of God brings a powerful influence. The influence comes from the, from the fulfillment of the prophecies and the dreams and the visions. Instead of just having service events, we would do evangelism. Our service events would bring spiritual awakening. Our service events would bring kingdom growth. Instead of the church being filled with sickness and sadness and sorrow, it would be filled with joy and gladness and health. as we go forth after services out those doors there will be many who will hear our message and call out to the Lord to be saved God has saved us for more than just not sinning God has saved us for more than just not going to hell we are, we are saved more than just to be pardoned from our sins, more than we are just delivered from habits or addictions or bondages. We are more than just survivors. We are more than conquerors. It is the awe, the fear of God that will conquer. David, when he was facing the giant or about to face the giant, he made this statement, the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you, meaning the giant, into our hands. David could speak that way because of his fear of God. There was an awe that he carried around inside of him. That who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Can, can I say this another way? Don't be offended and don't send me cards and letters. Who is this undecircumcised president who would have come against the army of the living God? David didn't need the armor of humanity. He was covered with the armor of God. See, there's a much deeper life and walk with God than just not doing sinful things. Do you realize that if your testimony is you just don't do sinful things, how shallow of a walk that really is with God? In the book of Daniel, chapter 11, it says, the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Exploits. That means going beyond the normal into the extraordinary in their command and in their affairs of life. With the Holy Spirit in us, we become trailblazers. We're, 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 we're pathfinders. <laughs> the church that God pours out his spirit into will be a church with fire. It will be electrifying. It will be exciting. It will be enthusiastic. It will be enlightening. Should I try that again? It will be electrifying. God will shock some of us. Ooh, yeah. If you were to come into a church, any church, and you walked in and you sat down, you had never been there before, and everybody just sat, would you go back? Or would you be looking for a little more excitement? See, the Bible talks about an early rain and a later rain. And he says that the later rain will be greater than the early rain. There's a scripture we've been quoting quite a bit. It says, the glory of the latter temple shall be greater than that of the former temple. There will be an anointing that we will walk in to deliver from the, be delivered from the trap of temptations. There will be an anointing that we will walk in to not fear the terror of night. There will be an anointing that we will walk in that will, will deliver us from the destructive plagues. There will be an anointing that we will walk in that will crush snakes and trample the serpents under our feet. There will be an anointing that we will walk on that we can call upon the Lord and he will rescue, he will release, and he will restore us. There is an anointing that we will walk in, that we will be satisfied with his salvation.
salvation. His indwelling will produce fruit, much fruit. Most of us, when we read from the scriptures in regards to the fruit, you know, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, kindness, faithfulness, <clears throat> so on and so forth, when we read that, we don't read that as though it's power. We just think of a fruit. No, it's power. Do you know how powerful love is? How powerful joy is? How powerful peace is? How powerful contentment is? Huh? Do you realize how, when, when you are faithful, how much power there is in being faithful or self-controlled? It takes a lot of power to have self-control. And God said, you will bear much fruit, much power. Dare I say that this church that has, has the anointing, a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit will produce fresh, powerful fruit. Not just fruit, but fresh fruit. That church will be, will be enabled with a fresh power to really love, to really have joy, to really have peace, etc., etc. And the prophecies that come forth will be fresh, hot off the mind and heart of God. The dreams of old men and women will be fresh. They won't spend their time looking back at what was, but they're looking forward to what God wants to do today and tomorrow. All of those great testimonies of the people who are all the gray hairs, we all, we all got a little bit of, we remember what happened way back when. We remember what God used to be. Man, when Jenny and I were growing up in the church, we, had, we knew what time Sunday night service was going to start, but we had no idea when it would get over. Some of you are nodding your heads. You remember those days. Let's get back to those days. If we've got too busy for God, then we've gotten too busy. Yes. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says this, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, Shall you not know it? See, the visions of the young men and young women will be fresh. There will be new ideas, new imaginations, new influences, new inspiration, new integrity, new int intimacy, and new inventions. For the Bible says there, where there is no vision, the people perish. I believe the church, the believers in Jesus Christ, will receive a freshening up. A, a strengthening to stand, therefore, in the liberty with which God has made us free. John 8, 36 says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Yes, See, the Holy Spirit influence will produce manifestation of the Holy Spirit's gifts. The church will have a word or a message of wisdom. Instead of words of gossip and opinion, just say, ouch. We will hear and know the heart and mind of God, and therefore we will know God's direction. The church will have a word or a message of knowledge. There will dwell in this church a supernatural revelation of God and his work. And the church will be filled with faith instead of doubt and worry. And they will be living and walking in the Spirit's guidance and direction. That church will experience the healing power of God for the emotional, physical, and spiritual sickness in and of our world. The church will have miraculous power. Signs and wonders will be performed in their midst. That church will distinguish and extinguish the spirits. And we won't be tricked by false doctrines or theologies. That church will be filled with a fresh word from the Lord in the, in the prophecies of tongues and interpretations. It's no wonder this morning that God spoke to us through a message of tongues with interpretation. Why? Because we set aside a solemn, a sacred assembly this past week, and some came, and we prayed, and we believed God for it. And guess what? God said, I heard you this past week. I heard you come to pray. I heard that you did what I told you to do in my word, and therefore hear my word to you this this morning and wouldn't you agree that though that message is not new it, it was fresh for us this morning we need to surrender our lives and it fit in exactly with the songs that were picked 
Holy Spirit's not at a loss at what to do. You know, that day of Pentecost, after, after the day of Pentecost, then Peter stood and preached and proclaimed, this is the fulfillment of the prophet of, or prophecy of Joel. And all those who are filled with the Holy Spirit spake in other tongues. They alone constituted the total number of the new Christian community at that moment. And notice they were all filled with the Spirit. That was one of the marks of the early church, that of being filled with the Holy Spirit. You weren't really considered a part of the church unless you'd not only been saved, but been filled with the Holy Spirit. Then you were recognized as the church. It was the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. The reality of what took place was the promise of Christ. The apostles' message was understood by the whole community. And the Word of God tells us that daily, every day, people were being added to the church. Daily, children were being added to the, to the church. Daily, work associates were being added to the church. Daily, bosses were being added to the church. Daily, neighbors were being added to the kingdom of God. Daily, that was happening. By the time you get to chapter 6 in the book of Acts, that church was probably somewhere around 35,000 people. Now, that'd be fun to go to church with, wouldn't it? This is yes. Their speaking in other languages was an endowment of power in the gifts and in the fruit. This promise, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is to you and to your children and to as many as God calls in the future. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Maybe another way to say that is this. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Oh, how I long to see our children living under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. My heart weeps over that, that somehow our children would come to that place of living under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I long to see God open the graves of wayward children returning to serve Christ with all of their life. Amen. In every church, in every church I know, there's a certain amount of adults in that church who have served God all of their lives. They raised their children in the church. They taught them the word of God. They, the, those children had experiences with God, but they've walked away. It may not even be this morning that they're doing such bad or horrible things. They're just away from God. But somehow our hearts need to get to that place where we say, Lord, please, would you call those wayward children home? You've talked, you've preached, you've shared scripture. You've tried to scare them into coming back to God. You've done just everything you can. But somewhere along the line, what the church needs is the inspiration and the infilling and indwelling of the Holy Spirit so that he can pour out his spirit upon them. And they'll come back, not because of us, but because of him. Boy, will they be solid when they come back to him instead of to just you and me. The promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is to say, you have a future. There is nothing to fear of the future to all those who gathered for the solemn sacred assembly. And I would add <clears throat> to those who fasted and wept and prayed and to those who had turned to God with their whole heart. Zephaniah 2.3 says this in essence, to all those who are seeking God, they will be hidden on the day of God's wrath and God's judgment. While the locusts are eating and the storm clouds of God's judgment are coming ever nearer, God is calling us with tender invitation to gather in his sanctuary for a solemn, sacred assembly of fasting and weeping 
and praying. The promise is, if we will dwell in the secret place, we shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Never underestimate the importance of gathering with the local church believers. Christ died that the church might be established. And his word even says to us, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together, even more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, if you will seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. For all those who gathered in that upper room on the day of Pentecost. Oh, by the way, don't you wonder what they did for 10 days? Don't you wonder what they talked about? I bet they weren't talking about social issues. I bet they were talking about God. I bet they were repenting. I bet they were spending time making sure that everything was right between everybody that was in that upper room. What we do know is this, is that they waited for God to pour out his spirit upon those and all of those who came and hoped for the promise. Jesus called for that very first solemn sacred assembly to that newly established Christian community of people. And they gathered in the upper room for 10 days. And I would believe that while they were in that solemn, sacred assembly, there was fasting, there was weeping, and there was praying. And they were turning their hearts to God, and they were opening and rendering their hearts to God. And God poured out his Spirit upon all of those who hoped for the promise. And God established a new community of believers filled with the Holy Spirit power and anointing. God has called Orchard Assembly to conduct solemn sacred assemblies throughout this year. I've asked you a couple of Sundays ago, and we even handed out some papers of what to pray, that every month we would set aside three days of fasting and prayer. Not necessarily three days in a row, but three days throughout a month. One tithe of your, of, your, of your month to set aside and say, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend time that day praying to you. God is calling us to fast, to weep, and to pray for an outpouring of his spirit. God is calling us to turn to God with our whole hearts and to open or render our hearts so that we can, he can live inside of us. Christ coming to live inside of us will be a radical, deep, extreme, entire change, but it will prepare us for the rapture. God is calling us to more than an outward holiness but to an inward righteousness and purity. So we're only two and a half months into this new year. We've just begun the journey towards God. I would challenge us to join the three days of solemn, sacred assembly each month with fasting, weeping, and praying with our hearts that they might be turned towards God in a greater message or measure. I want you to stand with me, if you would, this morning, please. If you can. If you can't, it's okay. I've called you to these altars before on Sunday mornings, and I'm going to call you to the altars again this morning. As a whole assembly, would you come? Would you stand with me across the front of this sanctuary, please? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Isaiah 56, or 55, verse 6, I'm sorry. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I don't know if you have been watching the news or not. If you're watching the local news, you didn't hear this at all. If you're watching what's going on in Israel, you've heard it. There are four red heifers that are somewhere in the West Bank in Israel. 
what we know is this, or at least the tradition of the church is this, is that when they sacrifice one of those red heifers, it is a signal to the nation of Israel to rebuild that third temple. The plan right now is for on their, what we call Easter, their, their, their Passover, to sacrifice one red heifer, which will speak to the entire nation of Israel. It's time to rebuild the temple, which will signify for them the Messiah coming. The only problem is, is that in the beginning, they're going to be deluged, deluded into believing that the Antichrist is their Messiah. They'll soon learn. It takes about three and a half years. But if that is the case, that the temple is about to begin and all the, all the construction material is there, it's all there. It's all in Jerusalem. They don't have to go out and buy anything. They're ready to rebuild. That means that the rapture is just that much closer to where we are today. The word that was spoken to us this morning was surrender to me. All of you, surrender all of you to me. That's the word that was given to us this morning. It wasn't the word I preached, it was the word God preached. We need to this morning, as we stand here at the altar, we need to say, God, I surrender all to you. I surrender it all to you, Lord. I realize you're coming. Listen, I don't want, I, I want you to do this just so you don't miss the rapture. You don't want to miss the rapture, believe me. But at the same time, I don't want you to do this just so that you can miss the rapture. Or, yeah, so that you won't miss the rapture. I want you to do this because you would say this morning, Lord, I really do want you to be in my life fully, completely. No longer walking in fear or living in worry, but Lord, I give it to you. Some of you may have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit this morning. This is as good a time as any to let that happen to you this morning. I can't baptize you. I can't make it happen. Your surrender to him does. So I just want to encourage you this morning, right now, as we're standing here, I want you to just begin to begin to start praying. Lord, I surrender to you. Lord, I give you all of my life. All of it, Lord. Not just some of it, but all of it, Lord. I give it to you. I surrender to you this day.